Hi guys, Jonathan here, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries, as a lot of you will know by now. So, um, right off the bat, I know that uh, some of you are patiently waiting for a new book, actually two new books that I've, I've contributed to and feature some of the objects here at the Armouries, including this thing that I'm about to get into. Um, so there's Ben Nicholson's Clockwork Basilisk book, and to support that, um, I also helped with, so in there is a, in this book is a booklet, um, who invented the wheel gun, and the answers in, well, yeah, does what it says on the tin, basically. I contributed an essay to that, which kind of pulls out one of the strands of the first chapter of that book about the Collier revolver. So the Clockwork Basilisk is about the Collier, which you might have heard about. Uh, if you haven't, it's a fascinating contraption from the very beginning of the 19th century. But the revolver has a much older history. So the first chapter kind of leads into that. This Who Invented the Wheel Gun book, the point of that essay, that essay is to really get into where did revolvers come from? So the Collier is a specific type of revolver with a very specific history, and that smashes into Sam Colt and his, his activities with the definitive percussion revolver. All very interesting, but I, after many years of looking at early revolvers and writing a couple of articles on them already, and then contributing to Ben's book, I really wanted to get into where did, they, where did it all come from? So, without spoiling too much of the booklet or the book, here we go with this object. This is part of our collection, of course. It's not in the greatest condition, unfortunately, um, and it's by no means unique. So several collections have uh, early revolvers of this nature, loose nature. Ours is not in the best of condition. We're up front about that. Um, let's just show you, I'll try to show you what I mean. So this thing is from about 1597. And I'll explain to you in a moment why we say about, but with such a hyper-specific date, which means that it has been hanging around knocking around <laughs> for a while before it ends up in our collection. Now, we are a modern, national, accredited museum. We look after things, I like to think. Um, but our history at the Tower of London was not always that of a, of a true museum. And this thing came from, as I can try to show you, stamped into this thing rather horrifically, for, from a professional point of view, is a stamp. M.A. really deeply stamped into the iron of this revolver cylinder here. That marks this as the property of the Museum of Artillery, which is where this thing came to us from. Uh, we don't know its history before that. It would have been purchased from a probably a, a schloss somewhere in Germany, most likely, because these are these early guns are mostly Germanic. So about 1597 um, would have been beautifully inlaid with, um, I believe, so we've got Mother of Pearl here on this sort of um, side flat of this cheek stock. This is for firing from your cheek, not from your shoulder. Recoil on this would be pretty, pretty minimal. And it, it was the style, it was the, <laughs> the style of the time to fire from the, from the cheek. Um, but yeah, there's like a, there's a mother of pearl disc set in this side. There's another one missing, sadly. And there is a big disc here with a bird engraved on it. So that's all mother of pearl and a couple of bits on the forestock as well. Um, the rest of the decoration is, well, I think there's bone and antler in there, interestingly. You, you, you often do get a mix. Sometimes bone, antler, and horn all on the same gun. Because at the end of the day, this is a sporting gun. This is for really showing off on the hunting field or, um, or simply having on the wall. So like a lot of, like, I mean, ignore this, ignore this strange device in the middle for the moment. Everything else about this gun says sporting gun. This is for, in theory, most likely, shooting birds on the ground or small game um, or <laughs> quite possibly for never shooting and having on the wall or just getting down to show people or perhaps plinking at targets in in the garden or the, the estate 
to show the uh, the latest technology that you have because this is absolutely the state of the art circa 1597. Um, why? Well, I think you've probably <laughs> intuitively figured this out. This is not the self-rotating revolver um, that Samuel Colt uh, ignored <laughs> when he uh, came to Britain in the 1850s and realized someone else had already done what he'd done. As in, when you cock the hammer or the cock, the cylinder turns. It's not that. This is the original type of revolver, the manually operated revolver. And that did carry on in parallel to these clever self-rotating ones where you cock them and they turn um, for well, a couple of hundred years, really. Um, we have some 19th century Indian um, examples that you still manually turn the cylinder on. So this is missing a key bit of kit being the actual what we would call a frizzen today. They would have called a steel or a hammer, confusingly. That would have clamped on, I believe, to this arm here. There are tiny little divots on here suggestive of something being clamped on here. Bearing in mind this might not have seen much practical actual use. There's an outside chance that this thing is a sliding frizzen that would have sat on this, but there's no, there are no real witness marks here suggesting it would slide back when struck by the falling cock. This is a conventional falling flintlock cock, um, but this is the snap hands system before we had the pan cover and the pan full of priming powder combined in that iconic um, flintlock system that both the English and the French worked on. This, I mean, you couldn't do that with this anyway, because you have to have a pan, excuse my rattling label here, you have to have a, a a, a pan with a sliding cover. They're all missing, unfortunately, on this one. So you'd prime each one of these eight pans. This is an eight-shot revolver. Let's just prove that to you. So pretty... This makes, inevitably, early revolvers... Well, any revolver, in theory, is bigger and heavier than a single-shot firearm, for obvious reasons. Lots more mass in the cylinder. So relatively small bore for that reason. You keep the bore down to about 50 caliber. Small bore for those days then you can afford to squeeze in eight shots. Could have made it smaller and lighter if they'd gone with six. Some of these are six. Um, eight is really the practical maximum for this system. So priming powder in each one of these pans, slide all the covers shut, obviously as you go, otherwise the powder will fall out. And you muzzle load powder and ball into each one of these, very time consuming to do that, of course. But once you've done that, you have eight shots on board and all you need to do is bring this to the, you could just go straight to full cock, make sure the, fris the frizzen is pivoted down into position, so it would have sat about here, vertical uh, face of steel to strike off those sparks. You'd have to have opened your pan first. This doesn't auto open the pans as some of the later guns do. So it, you can already, you're stacking up the number of actions it takes to actually shoot this thing. It's not cock it, fire it, cock it, fire it. It's not even cock it, close the frizzen fire it as the, the later guns, like the, the daft revolver that we have on display here at the museum, do. So, prime, load, probably want to prime last, slide them all shut, and then when you're ready to fire, bring this to the, to the cock position, bring the frizzen down, open your pan, pull the trigger, hopefully the gun goes off, it should do. They were quite reliable in, in that respect. One shot is fired. You then have to, and I cannot demonstrate this for you, manually index the, revol the revolving cylinder one to the, to the left, most likely. There is a flat spring on top of the barrel here. That's your only indexing. So with wear and time, this is going to go out of whack. Uh, there's no reliable way to index that cylinder. That's the other feature of things like the Colt that made them so successful, is that they're precisely made to always index so that the, the chamber lines up with the bore. You're not shaving off lead as the bore goes down the barrel. Uh, you're not having some sort of explosion or something. So this is a little bit dicey by modern standards, or even by Collier standards for that matter. And then you, you don't have to reprime, but you do have to open your pan cover, bring the frizzen down and cock it. So you could do those in, in whatever order makes sense to you. But, so several actions required to shoot this thing, but you do get eight shots on board. You don't have to carry, you don't have to carry a powder flask um, around with you. 
and, and a pouch of, of lead balls. Arguably convenient on the hunting field. This does have a patch box, interestingly. I suspect that was for additional bullets on these, but that's pure speculation on my part. Normally it would be for patches um, to allow for a proper fit in the, in the ball. So we don't actually know necessarily what this was used for. It's missing its sliding cover. If you, if you look at similar examples in our online collection, you'll see what that might have looked like. Um, but yeah, profusely de decorated, as I've said. Um, now, 1597. Why do I keep saying 1597? So there are about 15 of these. They are nearly all long guns. Short, but shoulder fired or cheek fired. Relatively long carbines, we would, we would call them today. Um, they are all about this date. The only way we can pin them to anything like as precise as 1597 as an example in Norway, uh, the, the Maihaugen collection, which is also a handgun, a pistol. Um, so, and we always tend to think these days as a revolver, of a revolver as a handgun. So if you're looking for that magic first ever for what you think and I think of typically as a revolver, it's theirs, not ours. But <laughs> most of them are not handguns. The, the application of revolving technology to a handgun was not seen as the priority in those days, circa 1600. It was more the shoulder fired, the cheek fired side of things. Uh, other examples, um, the Danish National Museum, um, the German National Museum, the Musée de Chasse in, uh, in France. So there aren't tons of these, 15 or thereabouts. There might, be, might even be a couple more that I haven't identified. Is not much in the scheme of things. After several hundred years, that's not much. But it does hint that there may well have been more of these around than we think. So people had multi-shot firearms by 1600. So that Maihaugen example has a known, uh, it literally has the date on the butt. It has a known later owner from a couple of generations later and a maker's mark. And some of these other guns are also made by the Stoppler family of Nuremberg, again, Germanic. Our gun doesn't have either a date or a maker's mark on it. So we can't in theory date it, but we know from its stylistic form um, it's German, it's Germanic. It's, it may not be by Hans Stoppler the Younger, like the, the, the couple of the other examples, but it's someone working in the same style. So we can say ours is about 1597. That's why we have that very precise date with a steady on about kind of qualifier attached to it. You can, if you prefer, say about 1600, because there really isn't much in it there. So there you are. The revolver is invented by 1597 in Europe, and it's another. Um, well, less than a hundred years actually before somebody has figured out how to make it revolve itself, which which I think is fascinating. But of course, it had to wait for um, Elisha Collier and Artemis Wheeler, and then Sam Colt to come along and really popularise the revolver and turn it into the thing we know today. So, if you want to learn more about that, um, you can buy the booklet "Who Invented the Wheel Gun" separately from the Basilisk, uh, um, the Clockwork Basilisk book. If you're super keen, obviously you can go, go and buy both. Um, check that out over on the HeadSamp website if you haven't already purchased. Those of you ha who have already purchased, thank you so much for doing that. I know the guys at HeadStamp and I, as the, one of the authors, really appreciate it. And we thought you'd like to get a sneak peek at one of the, the stars of my little contribution to that book. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. We really do appreciate it. Um, do remember, if you're not already subscribed, hit the subscribe button and of course we always appreciate a like click as well goes a long way um, and you can come and visit our real life museums if you'd like to do that we also have if you'd like to see these videos uh, without advertisements you can go to or download the app or go to the website history of weapons and war and a lot of the other uh, firearm and military history based youtube channels are also over there with something extra to offer you, whether that's um, no ads or even extra content in some cases as well. So please do go and check that out, see if it's something you'd like to, to sign up for. But you'll always be able to see um, the videos here for free, of course. See you again next time.